Uh, this is the pre-hospital yeah. section. Yeah. Uh, I'm a PGY 21, if you believe that. I work at Kings County in New York Presbyterian, Queens, and I teach residents, paramedics, and PAs and MPs. Uh, this scenario is three phases. And the first phase is a simple phase, and it sounds very uncomplicated, but it's very unique. So imagine a person has, oops, it's already undone. Imagine a guy comes in with a wired shut jaw, with the wires in. Imagine he has trismus, he can't open his mouth because uh, he has trismus, bad arthritis of the jaw. Maybe he has angioedema, maybe he has Ludwig's angina. If I can't put air through the mouth, these two orifices, and there, there's naturally a nose here, I can actually put a device in the nose, not on myself, that I can actually aerate oxygen through. So actually, when I think of the scenario of the trismus and I can't open the mouth, I think of a large enough nasopharyngeal airway it goes from my mouth down to the back to the angle of my jaw. And I think of an 80 et tube. And why an 80 et tube? If it's wide, and this connector takes, it's tight. And it will be tightly fitted through the nasopharyngeal airway. And if I can do this, I can possibly oxygenate this patient. So I think for this mannequin, uh, I'm going to lube this. Naturally, it would be lubrication, not blood or COVID muco mucosa or saliva, but go through the nose, hub it, and then I would cover the other nostril and aerate. There's even a cooler scenario that I don't have is that helmeted patient who I can't access the jaw or the mouth, but the nose is open, and I can oxygenate this patient and keep him alive. Ask for help. Or find my scalpel and do a surgical airway. So that's phase one. On phase two, I'm teaching uh, my students in the station. I'm going to teach them the three ways I teach how I intubate uh, medics, paramedics, or any airway student in the field in very unusual situations. It's based on your comfort level and, how, and your training. So the first technique sounds very unique and very interesting. Uh, I call it the Superman technique. And the reason I call it the Superman technique, when you see me on the floor, you'll understand. This technique oh, requires me to get on the ground. I don't have to do this, but this is just to emphasize the Superman technique. And basically, I get on the ground with my belly on the ground and get the tube in. Now, some people will think of me as a hero for getting the tube in. It doesn't really matter. It's getting the tube in right as quick as possible. Right now I'm using an ET tube with a McGrath video laryngoscope. I'm using the primate method to keep it secure. I secure it and that's just one method of how I teach my medics. But this requires you to get on the ground, have no shame, and care about the patient more than yourself. Right? That's one technique. The second technique will be the two-person helper technique. So the two, I used to call it the two-man, but now I call it the two-person EMS helper technique. And that technique requires me to ask a colleague of mine to hold the wrist of the patient, uh, caress with your ankles against the torso. No, no, secure? Yes. First, lower down a little bit. Secure your ankles first against the torso, like the hips, so it doesn't move. And then lift. So now I don't have to be on the ground as much. I can either get on my knees, both knees. If I really want to practice my yoga or my Bruce Lee stance, I can integrate it like this. Or I can just do this. So the, the reason that this maneuver is ideal, the stomach stays down here, the lungs stay here, and the head is elevated. Maximizing intubation. If I were really tall, I would actually ask my helper to actually pull it even higher, so I'd actually be intubating like this. That makes sense? Gravity will help me prevent aspiration because gravity will prevent passive regurgitation. And this is, of course, not a cardiac arrest patient. This is a respiratory arrest patient with a pulse. So you're doing okay? What's ideal with his technique is he's bracing his weight down and using leverage. He's not, this is not a heavy patient. And that's why he's able to do this long enough. If this were a heavy patient and he was deadlifting, his arms would tire out already. So this technique, a petite woman, 
petite man, large woman, large man, anybody can do this. But your helper has to be, know what he's doing. You're doing good? Yeah. Okay. To the chords. Intubate. Again, let me use my thumb. Grab. Lip line 21, 22. And it's in. The other ways to reassure first pass success. The last technique oh, is called the mother's caress. Or the, and the reason is because it's personal. You bring the patient's head and torso to your thigh. Only a mother would, regardless of what happens to this patient, do this. So that's why it's a mother's <laughs> embrace or caress. So as close as I intimate I am to this patient, you'd open the mouth. Oops. Uh, I have to lean back. Get the tube in. Thumb also to confirm to, that it stays secure. Pull out the bougie and it's in. Not everyone likes sex technique because you have to be very close and intimate to a messy patient. So that's the last part of phase two. So the last part takes undoing what's been done for a long time, is emphasizing intubation over putting a, a supraglottic airway. Both of them are advanced airways, but we have to check our egos, especially with resources. If I'm only one who's managing the airway, managing uh, poor circulation, a cardiac arrest, a very sick patient, and I don't have the staff, I have to maximize my time. This may take a while to get the tube in, but putting a device like this, I don't have to interrupt CPR. And if you ideally you put a supraglottic airway, this happens to be something that looks like an LMA. I'm not gonna say the name brand, iGel. But this device works. And the reason I'm telling you this is if I put the patient up with CPR, now some people CPR is more vigorous, this Lucas, maybe not as vigorous as my CPR, but during this CPR, I don't have to stop my CPR to do something very unique. So this, I bias and I call a Torres grip. Grab the jaw, grab the tip of the tongue with your thumb. Distract hard and push this against the hard palate, this supraglottic area, until resistance is met. The ideal part to this is I did not have to interrupt CPR to put this device in. You don't have to do three to two pauses for oxygenation and CPR compressions. And, and impress me the most by getting the pulse back. Once the pulse comes back, then we can play around and intubate an alive patient. But until he's alive, he's currently dead. Does that make sense? So make it simple while you don't have the staff, and maybe you only have time to put the supraglottic airway while you put an IO in, and start asking for barking orders or putting orders on Epic. Make sense, guys? Thank you. So when I do these scenarios, everyone who watches the scenario with me should reenact what I'm doing with my hands. And you can usually do this at home. So I have many videos with airway that people say, oh, Dr. Torres, I have to practice the way you did it. And you theoretically can. You can watch the video, watch how I stand and how I use my hands. You have to pretend you're in the room and doing the, the procedure. Even better is when an actual resuscitation is happening, an airway issue, is to pretend that you're doing the airway and what would I do? What meds I would order? How I would prep the patient? Don't wait for a free TV show and a free movie. Act like you're the, would be what would happen if I were in charge. That makes sense? And you may disagree with the other person. And maybe you would be right in the future. But if I reenact what's happening, you're rehearsing. Even after today, I hope at, at the end of this, and it sounds very cheesy, okay, this is what Dr. Torres did, and I would rehearse this in my head what I did. Because if you don't do that right away, you're gonna forget this. And then be like, I forgot this. I really, my patient suffered. And then the reason you learned it is because you suffered or your patient suffered. Does that make sense? You have to really reenact. The future is VR. I have no replacement yet, but I think that's the future. But I think this is how you should go about and practicing in your head mentally how you're doing this. That makes sense?